I know, we should definitely do some playing. Man, I'm yours. Yeah, I'm down. I'm down. Beautiful. Cool. I'll let people in. Anything you want to cover? Anything? You- Mostly you- politics. I hope that's cool with you. Sure. <laughs> No, I don't know the first. No, anything, anything. Probably not. What are you doing? I'm just with you, man. Is, is the Alexander technique something relevant for you? You know, uh, as a foundation for my whole life, yes. But but nothing that I, I you know, uh, I'm not teaching it per se. But it's always, you know, I reference it. It's a touchstone for me in a big way. You know. But, so officially, uh, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's it's. Uh, so officially, can't... we have no idea what we're doing here tonight. Well, this is what I was gonna say. It's uh, do you? How many have you done of these? You had quite the. A series. lot. Yeah. You could just sit there quietly and respectfully, and I'll do the whole thing. Look, that's why we're a good team. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, if there's anything that close to your heart, we'd love to hear it. Well, I I I have been thinking about with some stuff musically for sure. Um, Okay. You know, some, some, yeah, it's kind of technical stuff. I don't know how, how nerdy do you like to get with these things? Is it, or is it more? You know what? Why don't we start off with whatever warms you to this space yeah. and time? So if, let's start with uh, Vivian. Would you like to do the introductions? Yeah. Oh, oh my mic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still admitting everybody. Um, good to see you all. It's been, uh, yeah, two weeks. We skipped a week. I hope everybody got through it. Um, happy to see all your faces. And for this special one, we have not only Kenny Werner, as usual, but also um, the amazing Julian Lash, ah. who is not only famous because of his guitar playing and his composing, but also um, very much into Alexander technique. And that's why... I think, um, you know. Are we trying to find a reason why soul. we invited him here tonight? Well, no. I, I, I paid. You can be He's honest. Been hang. Into it. <laughs> That's how I we, get work. A couple of years ago, we also had you during our classes, and that was really amazing. So, obviously, we'd love to have that again. Yeah. Thank One you. of the greatest yeah. examples of uh, inspired and and above the fray when it comes to playing the instrument, which is really what we're talking about wow. comfortably within. But, you know, Julian, do you remember how we met? Well, I remember, I, I, I remember vividly the, the encounter once we were up on stage together, playing together. But I think well, why, just, don't, why don't you give your, uh, well, yeah, absolutely. I was, I mean, then I, I'll give my thing of how we met. Uh, it's, okay. a same, it's the same event for sure. It's the same event. I would have been about um, eight years old and I was, uh, I was young. I was like, I think eight or nine because I had just started studying with Randy Vincent, um, the great jazz guitar player, my kind of main teacher, right? In California. Yeah. And one of the very first things that he and I covered um, just quite organically was Effortless Mastery. It was your book. You know, and it came into the picture and I don't know what the context was for other than Randy being like, check this out, you know, and I was like, this is great. And uh, so we, we, we were your fans, Kenny, we, we still are, but that was, that's our story. And then lo and behold, you came to Sonoma State University out in Roner Park, California, which is where Randy's the guitar teacher and I they, they let, let me sit in on your class, you know, um, when I was mesmerized and I was just like, oh my God, this is the greatest. I mean, really, I don't, I, I say that with no uh, hyperbole. I really was like, it was one of those kind of mind blowing uh, life experiences. And like the, the next few hours of the day after the masterclass are blurry. I don't remember much until you and I were on stage together. You so graciously invited me to play with you. And, um, we played all the things you are together. Yes. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. And it was, uh, it was magnificent. I mean, Kenny, it's so funny. I mean, it's, it's, if it, it feels like it was yesterday. And I remember there was a sense of a sympathetic, um, quality of listening and, in adventure and risk and playfulness. And, you know, all these qualities that I couldn't maybe, 
I wouldn't venture to identify at the time, but all these years later, I realized that's, I'm, I'm kind of trying to do the same shit, you know, as we did that day. And, and, uh, so it was, that, that was my experience with it. And then obviously we've been friends for since. Yeah. So <laughs> I was, I the thing is, no, well, I have a little funnier take yeah. on it, right? You know, yeah. I thought you were 11. Jeez, you were eight or nine. Oh, my God. I could have been 10. I mean, I, like I said, I started reading your stuff definitely when I was eight. Okay. Eight, and I just remember right after it, you were there. So maybe maybe I was. Well, Randy and I met, we did a, a Joe Henderson tour. Oh, I didn't realize that. So we were out. Um, I was doing this thing at Sonoma State. Yeah. And Randy comes up to me before I did the clinic. And I think you had been there, but... Yeah. <laughs> You're not going to remember this. Yeah. I guess I was tired or whatever, you know, or yeah. it was that era where, you know, the record companies were signing all these really young cats, you know, and yeah. I used to say, joke, they're signing embryos now, you know. <laughs> so um, Randy comes over, he says, man, this kid, you got to hear this kid play guitar. You gotta... yeah. And I looked at you and I said, kid, how old are you? And I thought you said 11, maybe yeah, it was 10, yeah. whatever, right? Yeah. I said, you got a record contract yet? And you went, no, Mr. Warner, like that. That same face you got now. And I said, well, you better get one sooner or you'll be too old. Yeah. <laughs> and then I walked away, right? Wow. <laughs> classic, man. I remember this because I've retold the story. That so so then we're in there. Yeah. And afterwards, Randy said, no, no, you really have to hear this kid. I said, yeah, yeah. it wasn't gracious. Yeah. Uh, Julian, I said, all right, kid, get up there. Like, yeah. I mean, that's my memory of it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we get up there and you say this sympathetic, yeah. yeah but yeah. what freaked me out was that you knew how to interact sympathetically. We played free before we went into it. That's right. And I'm thinking, I was actually rubbing, I didn't have glasses that time, and I'm rubbing my eyes. I'm looking at this little kid with this, of course, the guitar looks bigger, you know? Yeah. He's looking at me like this, he's going like. <laughs> and I'm going like, I'm going like, you know, like, kid, you're messing with me. You know, like, this is messing with me. In fact, Whoa. when people talk about reincarnation, I say, well, I felt that was a major I mean, how do you explain? It's one thing to play really good, really young. And these days, it's all over the place. But how do you have that experience? The only people I had that sympathetic exchange with in a free way yeah. were cats that were uh, my age, you know, at that time, my age, yeah. Yeah. that had had that experience. Right. You know? Right. So where I'm thinking, where did he get this experience? Yeah. And that's what I'm thinking. I'm absolutely thinking he's been here, he's done this before, you know. And then we played all the things you wanted. It was beautiful. Yeah. But uh, it was so very, very memorable for me too, Julian. Wow. I mean, that was surreal. It's surreal to hear it from your perspective because I, you know. And, and then the other thing about it that was very impressive to me, because then I was really gone on you, you know, your parents mm. talked to me, wonderful yeah. parents that really understood that they were caretakers yeah. of a spirit that arrived. You know, I mean, <laughs> that was at least as amazing as talking to your parents. They yeah. really understood who you were and what their role was, you know, and that you shouldn't just yeah. be uh, all music and that you should be challenged and you should be well-rounded. And uh, yeah. that was beautiful. And at one point I had the idea that I'll bet a lot of people had the idea. Let's put together some heavy, musicians and have you record because that was the thing it's totally the thing cats were doing and i was the thinking way. the same way yeah and you at this young age said no i i don't feel ready i really want to study more now how many more years was it before you actually felt ready oh like another it wasn't until i was like 23 or 24 i mean right. so and different. i mean some could argue in terms of just voice and tools and everything you could have been ready anywhere between then and then right but i think it's how much respect you have for the music yeah and uh, and a humility i mean people who are humble don't like to hear they're humble but the humility 
is really a lesson, you know, a lesson for everybody. You, you, you know, people that, you know, have a lot of a wisdom and, and talent and, and she, you know, yeah. To, you carry it, you know, that way, you know. It's so interesting you saying that, that in, in that manner, Kenny, you know, I, first of all, I, I, I appreciate that. I do think humility is the thing. And I, I think somewhere along the way, and maybe it's a jazz education thing, or maybe it's just a cultural thing, but I think humility and um, like self-hate kind of became synonymous or they've, you know, you have to be humble and you also have to think you're not very good. I started noticing this in school and college. You know? wow. Yeah. It's, it's, and, and, and it's subtle, um, you know, aggressions. It's not, I'm the worst ever, but it's going through every performance of your life going, that was fine, but it's, you know, I was, I'm not that good. Or, or I, sh you know, I could call this person who I respect and make music with them, but they don't care about me. So I'm just going to not call them, you know? And I, I, I think from an early age through osmosis or what, you know, behavior, not necessarily through a direct spoken lesson through Randy, through you, through my parents, through Gary Burton, there's always a sense of, um, you know, self-respect and humility, not self-hate and humility. You have to understand that you're like, you were talking about my parents, so sweetly saying about my parents, you know, they, they, their, their notion of caretaking and cultivating spirit is so, so profound. Anyone who knows my parents knows that. And I think I, I, I view myself and at the time viewed myself that way with music. It's like, I'm like not a parent to the music, but I, I need to steward it the way I'm being stewarded as a, as a young man. And with that, I always felt very encouraged and humble, but also really kind of gregarious in other ways you know I look back and I think even just to go on stage with you it was like I didn't I was like kind of crazy <laughs> you know what I mean I, in some way I would do these things where I'd be like sure I'm up for anything and uh I think that came from a, a humble place but also from a, like no I I if it, that is a humble place but yeah but but what I also felt good about, I never felt like you know I, I'm, I'm lucky Kenny I mean you you're also a, a person who not that this would ever, ever, ever happen because it's not your personality, but there are situations where young people are exploited by older people who make them feel less than, or, you know, even though in joking, you can say, you know, do you have a record deal kid? You're, you're not, you were coming from nothing but love. So I think there were these junctures where I would see myself, um, you know, if I hung out with certain older mentors, I saw the potential to feel kind of like a, kind of feel lame. You know, I never was with any adults who made me feel lame or inadequate. And I, and I, that's a testament to, um, well, a lot of things, my parents and those people, but I always, I was always, you know, very lucky. So, um, I don't know. It makes me sad when I see people who are so hard on their themselves that they're just sick to their stomach and I see it all the time. And I, I, I've, I've, you know, for a long time, my, my shit was like, if I, especially as a teenager, if I got support, I would find a way to kind of prove people wrong. So they said, you're great and you're doing great. I said, well, I'm not, I'm not that, you know, I'm not, I wait, I do, you know, I'm, I really got this other thing. And part of that was true. And part of it was just kind of self -sufficient. Were you just uncomfortable accepting that comment? Well, you know, that I think that's part of it, but I, I genuinely, I think there were times where I was identified with some sort of egoic voice that actually projected that the other person was wrong like you don't actually know what you're hearing i'm just a i'm a kid i can't i'm not that good like you know like i there was some dysmorphia that was probably um connected to not accepting the compliment but i think it was almost more entangled and just like i really had a vision of what i wanted to be able to do and um yeah, so they said, yeah, you may like what I'm doing now, but it's not what I want. But it's not the thing. So I almost can't relate to you, you know, because yeah. you're not hearing what I think it's going to be. And it's it's one of those, like I say, conditioned mind traps that I think is very human and very understandable. Um, How do you feel about it now? It's funny, man, I, especially in light of the pandemic and the tremendous loss and the tremendous healing that's like 
you know, I feel like it's this mass healing that's like underway and about to be underway. I, I definitely feel more, I feel really grateful that I have ever been able to pick up a guitar and play music ever. Like I, like, I always have felt that to a degree. Now it feels stronger. So, um, it's kind of like vision be damned. If I, if I never learned anything else or did anything else, I just can't believe I ever got to do it. Mm. And having said that, when I have time to myself to play or work on something, I, you know, I recognize there's so, there, there's so much yet to be done. So it's, it's not a resignation, but it is kind of like, it's, it's everything else is a bonus round, you know, is how I feel about it. And I want to, you know, I want to, I want to fight for what I believe in as a musician. You know, I really, I think there are times in my life where I've maybe been a little more passive and having a point of view artistically. And in, in... so I kind of feel like I both now I'm kind of cool. And I also am really hungry and I, and, and they're, they're finding their, their, you know, their equilibrium inside of me. Can, can you give voice to, now sometimes we say something yeah. and I don't mean to turn it into such a literal thing, but, uh, what do you believe what you say fight for what i believe in yeah and i assume you're talking about musically i, I mean it musically and also or is music the medium to fight with for what you believe in well, beyond it, music or is it right. i mean can you can you give yeah. uh can you give voice to what it is that you're what do you fight what is it you want to fight for well absolutely i mean yes it's two it's twofold you know on one level in a world where systemic racism and oppression and inequality and the suffering that's so real is so, um, I mean, it's, it's nothing new, very sadly. And yet there's, there's a certain consciousness about it. I recognize that art and music have the potential to um, raise the vibrational level. You know, it's like, I, I see music as, um, it's magic. You know, it's invisible. It goes through walls. It goes through the air and it affects people all over the world. So it's there, there's a certain, that's the one part of it, which is I'm just in touch with the fact that I, I believe and want to fight for the fact that this is a medium that can heal, however you define that. And I also recognize there's the other side of that is that there's, you know, um, as educators, Kenny, you've used this platform for good for so long. I, I think I'm more aware of the need to fight for um, when I have people's attention, which I'm so fortunate to have the attention of people at times, um, that it's imbued with a sense of thoughtfulness and love and curiosity, whether that's through speech or whether it's through music. Um, so it's kind of like when I say fight, it's 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 about really believing in the medium and, and really saying, well, okay, I can write a song because I wanted to write a song or I can write a song to see what kind of music uh, raises my consciousness, you know, and come on, this is not novel at all. We're talking about a love Supreme at the end of the day, you know? So it's like, it's the thing, it's the thing that Blackwell teaches us, the thing that Ornette teaches us, teach, the thing that Jim Hall teaches us. It's Charlie, I mean, it's, it's, it's our music. And, um, I think I really, be I believe in the music, you know, I believe in jazz and I believe in the community and the culture and, and um, the African-American traditions it comes from and the international traditions it comes from. It's like, it's, I just recognize that it's my responsibility to really, um, you know, try to process that. And so, and I do think that comes through in the music. I do think you hear a difference. I, I always, I was thinking the other day about Mal Waldron. Oh, one of my guys. I mean, right? I figured. I, I kind of figured. I was like that. But, so, and to me, like an artist like Mal Waldron is an artist who blurs that line where he's obviously aware of the power of the medium. He's obviously aware of the message that needs to come through the medium. And he seems, and again, I'm I'm talking about Mal Waldron as just a fan, right? Not, not someone like you, I presume, was around him. Um, well, you know what happened to Mal Waldron, right? I, I I don't really I, it's, I know something I, I know something happened. 
Well, only that he, I, I'm not sure if it was a heart attack or what, but when he came out of whatever was wrong with him, he totally forgot how to play. Right. Oh, I see. I so didn't know. He, came I, back, I, I, he was a much more fundamental player. How interesting. And so I love you say Mal Waldron, because let me just fill in one thing of what you're saying. Yeah. People think, Julian, that only people like you, I mean, you don't, you're not wearing your tremendous achievement as a guitarist, mm. as an armor. Mm. You're actually ignoring it. And it's just, it's what it is. It's like, let's just say you were a billionaire. Yeah. You wouldn't walk around and say, don't forget it. Don't forget for a moment, I'm a billionaire, you know, right, right. you'd be saying, hi, how you doing? Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> try to put that out of your head. But a lot of people think I can't be a force like Julian Lodge unless I can play like Julian Lodge. Mm -hmm. And what I'm trying to supply to the people I'm in touch with, my students, yeah. any students, any people, is that you are as special as you will allow yourself to be there's a light yeah. in you and the world is one of the sayings i just told the class the other day the world is not made up but people say julian lodge or kenny Werner, not me yeah it's, and it's, that is not respect yes that's uh downgrading oneself the world is not made up of people who have it and people you know how they say some of us have it some of us don't everybody has it some of us know it and some of us don't god and we think the thing that gives us license is how good we play. Yeah. So what I love when you say about Mal, when someone comes from the essential soul that Mal came from, yeah. the one or or monk for that matter. Absolutely. You the question you never asked yourself was how good a piano player is he? he it doesn't even come up. It's just right. And Miles well, Davis is that too. I mean, if you want to just read trumpet players, yeah. I don't know if he's in the top five right of his time yeah so i'm trying to inf inf impress on my students first of all you can gain more tech i do want to hear what you're working on the funny thing is nobody would imagine what it is you would need to work on to increase whatever right. technology you already have but you see i find them very different subjects that come from completely different sides of my brain when right. i play i only have one job and I'm trying to pull my students out of that university funk of always judging themselves, which mm -hmm. is encouraged by university. Yeah, it's just there's no nobody's a villain. Everybody's a everybody's a, a you know a, like a, he, a victim. Yeah, yeah it's <laughs> the teachers. The uh, teachers are victims. Right. It's abuse that was passed on to them. They're passing it on to the students. Right. But the thing is, there's only one thing you should work on when you play: loving what's coming out yeah no you know if you're not loving it stop refocus and start loving it again mm -hmm. because there's only one pot because the the gratitude that you expressed yeah should not be defiled by trying to be critical of it while it's coming out and, and as you know there's no substitute for welcoming what's coming out you don't have the uh the luxury of analyzing it as it comes out and you certainly don't have the luxury of changing it while it's coming out. <laughs> no, you don't. So no matter how much someone told you, you should be playing differently than you're playing. Yeah. That cannot be your voice when it's time to play. You can deal with it when you're practicing. Yeah. Now, from another part of your brain is a part of the brain that is stimulated and enjoying the hobby. I like to call working on my playing my hobby. Yeah, yeah. That's because insane. that never has a destination. Yeah. So true. And you never have a bad feeling about how you're doing your hobby. No, that's so and, true. You're just like, right. it doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. It never ends. Yeah you're, yeah, you're building a little, um, you know, Chevy uh, cor <laughs> yeah. Corvette. Yeah. You're not going, I got to get this done because, you know, I'm not, I, I, I have a problem with self-esteem until I get to the, uh, you know, to the, to the Mustang, you know. I mean, it's just not like that. You're engrossed. Yes. The great joy of practicing is focusing on something right. and adding precision, specificity yeah. that you can then let go of and see how it's been added or not God. to your game. That's so true. So with our students and my students, 
Yeah. I'm trying to get those two things so the twins never meet. So they can work on music with a smile on their face instead of feeling a deficit. Right. Because a deficit only causes you to rush and skim. Right. And then you don't get better. And then it's a downward spiral. You don't believe you can get better. You, no, and it's reinforced by a number of right. Things. But then I want them to know that they have all the possibilities as a voice right. from day one. If they can do this, they're on. They're in. So Every good. possibility for influencing the world is right there with just a, a fifth. It doesn't have to be a fifth, but, but a fifth is sure. Ever. Yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's. So, I love what you're saying, but but everybody needs to know. And and when philosophy is expressed, yeah, the the flip side of that is sometimes they'll go, "How do I get to play like you? How do I get to play like you?" And then someone will be political or they'll be philosophical, right? And then it won't work for them because what they actually need is to learn on a deeper level how to play in form, yeah, exactly, <laughs> or how to play on changes. That's it. And without language, no philosophy will ever resonate. Yeah. Now you can make the choice, like say a Tim Byrne or something like that. Right, right. That that language is not what you're interested in. Yeah. And then make a language that, or, or a Zorn. It's totally. I mean, you're never going to ask Zorn to play giant steps. No. Or, or even Jane Ira Bloom, you know. Absolutely. But there are people that have enough self-respect to design a language from day one that they can express themselves in. Well, you know, Kenny, you know what just drops in if I'm just to add to that, because it's, you know what I think is sometimes missing? Like, like just, I mean, what do I know, right? I don't know, but you just, know everything. Everything. well, no, <laughs> but, but like, I mean, you know, you know what I find often is like, and, and, and this might also be generational. Like, I think the generation I grew up in is, you know, like every generation, there's these characteristics that are, that are, you could say they're valid or not, but whatever. And then the next generation, Gen Z, they have a whole different thing. Um, I, I, in general, when you're talking about Tim Byrne, Zorn, Jane, you, I mean, like my, the people I love, there's, there is a pointed, um, what's the word? A sense of catharsis and real intoxication with the music that's really palpable it's almost like a design function like where like zorn's a great example of someone who you know in addition to having music that has you know is strong for all these reasons it's also music that's gonna if you're engaged with it as a listener or performer it's gonna take your breath away at some point either because you're startled or because it's impressive or because it's a release but um Sometimes it's the personal power of the player. Absolutely. You can't even assess the music. It's exactly that. I yeah. mean, and there's a, I think, and, and, and I think a critique I've had of sometimes the kind of like a modern, I don't know, trajectory of looking at our playing and being at peace with it is that sometimes similar to the way uh, we talk about humility and self-hate, how they kind of, they become a thing. I think, I think effortlessness and also like a softness, like a gentility becomes synonymous. I've seen this and just students, I just, this around, I've seen it myself where, you know, the sound of presence is calm and it's peaceful. And a lot of the people we're talking, everyone we've mentioned today, including Mal Waldron, is there's something deeply arresting about it. There's something deep, every, as long as I've been a fan of yours, Kenny, there's something absolutely stop you in your tracks, arresting about just the power of what you're, you're dealing with that is accompanied by a loving presence, but you're throwing down the way our heroes throw down. And, and I think that I've definitely seen it where sometimes people think that's, you don't have to be polite, I guess, is what I've, I've learned. And educationally speaking, I, I find that sometimes hard to express. Um, well, the words are one way, and not everybody has a way with words, and I understand that. Most musicians do not. So yeah, that's fine. How do, you have, how, do you, how do you address it, though? Like, when you think of play, like, like I think of, um, 
I don't know. Like, like talk about Blackwell. You played with Blackwell, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, he didn't speak much at all. That's what I'm saying. And there's a player where if you listen to Ed Blackwell, it's it's losing humanity and love and all these things. And it's also it's it's frighteningly great. It's like it, it it's it, it and that's on a record. So um, I, I, I'm just curious how you speak to that quality because sometimes I feel like that's a one of the harder things conveys that you can be compassionate, and loving, but you can also be a total freaking badass and. And that can be a part of the the, the power. Um, well, you know, it's I, people sometimes have a spirit that is so connected to the music that they could have a lifetime that's in total disagreement with that. I mean, first of all, I'm a bit of a, an anomaly because no matter what I did with music, I really grew up with entertainment. I didn't really grow up with art. Right. I grew up in Long Island. Yeah. And uh, we watch television and we watch movies. Yeah. And it took a long time to admit that. Yeah. You know, I went to Manhattan School of Music and everybody there was a serious, there was no jazz. It was a classical wow. school. Wow. Oh yeah, this is way before it was a jazz, class, right. jazz school. And I was the only, I felt like I might have been the only person there that really didn't give a shit the difference between Mozart and Mendelssohn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I knew more about that music from movies I had watched. Yeah. But I got in because, I don't know, I played some Bach and I played some, so, you know, I never really had that respect for the art form, but I didn't get busted for it for myself. I didn't bust myself for it until I was around other talented people. And I said, wait a minute, you guys actually care wow. about this. So I was a bit of an anomaly. So when it came time to explaining things, I was much more verbal than most musicians. Yeah. The musicians yeah. that embodied it were not that verbal. And the music, the people that were more verbal couldn't play it for for. Anything. Right. <laughs> no, they, right. They'd be, be so poetic, and then they'd go, you know, <laughs> you know, and they'd say, "Wow, is that what consciousness yeah. gets you?" No, yeah. thanks. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I wanted to show people that you know, it's virtuosity, and not that I have it, but you do, know, developed. No, but I mean, you could be far, far developed and still never take your eye off the ball. So in other words, I have a, a turn of phrase. I'm good at turning a phrase. Virtuosity serves at the feet of consciousness. Yeah. Instead of consciousness guaranteeing, you know, extreme naivety in the music. This is this this is the thing, man. There's there is an Excalibur virtuoso thing that you cultivate with with the perspective you have and the consciousness that's so stunning. And I, I often am looking for ways to cultivate that. And, and well, train, train showed train us that was possible. And it's completely, I mean, that whole quartet. I mean, I was the first guy, right? Yep. He absolutely. I mean, and it's, it's really true. I mean, I was just listening to that, uh, McCoy record time for Tyner. Oh, I love that record. It's such a great record. And Bobby Hutcherson on there. I mean, they all sound incredible. And the way Bobby's playing too is another example of like maximalism. I mean, for lack of a better word, it is maximalism. It's Matt. He is playing so much, so much power and so much clarity. And it's obviously a feat of the instrument and it's completely transcendent. Again, coming from the culture. It is a quality of the instrument. It's a quality of the instrument, but I've you can you can similar to guitar, you know the vibraphone and the guitar both can be perpetual motion, but they can't they're not necessarily perpetually interesting, <laughs> and and it is a feat, you know. Amen. Right, um, but that's just an example of that of like yeah, you can be righteous and you can be cool and you can be in your face and there can be a certain like you know fuck you quality to it and also be completely at peace. And um, so when you're talking about Jane, for example, that's someone who. I always had a lot of respect for her. You could not hire her to play in the sax section of the Mel Lewis Orchestra. <laughs> no, because she I... always, she wasn't just trying to get gigs. Yeah. She it's... cultivated music from day one. And I can't say that I was similarly directed. I was always afraid. You know, it could be a little bit of a male-female thing too, because she was married to somebody who was working. Right. I was always afraid to not work. And I was, and I was responsible for somebody. So yeah. my thing was always, how can I monetize me being creative right but you know any variation is fine absolutely you know but yeah. uh funny thing is talking about bobby 
I yeah. played with him quite a bit too. One of the funniest cats ever. I, I knew him a little bit, and he. Cra- I was uh, like, I was a name. I was like a. a you couldn't spend know. ten minutes with him, and have not. He's not being funny already. Exactly. He was just a gl- beautiful, glorious man. I remember seeing him as a kid, just being like, right. unbelievable. But tell me, yeah, what was what was that like though? Well, I mean, it's so easy to be excessive on the vibes. Absolutely. You know, and I'm I'm pivoting now. That's it makes it all the more amazing the way Steve Nelson plays the vibes. Man, God bless Steve Nelson. That's I mean, amazing. how do you do that? Because everybody, yeah. it, you're drawn to, it's the action of playing it that makes it so easy. You know, it's like a piano with such a light action that you, it's easier to play 12 notes than eight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And the vibes are like that. But yeah. Bobby would play. But I mean, when I played with him, it was quite a time after that. At the time of Time for Tyner, McCoy, Bobby, all those cats yeah. were so tuned in on the language that was just evolving at that moment that had just come out of yeah. what was bebop into what would be called hard bop a minute before it became modal music. This is it. I'm so glad to talk to you about this because I've been thinking about this record for a long time. And I got into it because of uh, Jason Hainsworth at the San Francisco Conservatory and he and Jason Moran, they you know, they both grew up in Houston, and he was like, "This was a year or two ago." He's like, "Man, there's this record we grew up listening to as kids. You got to hear." And I've been, I, I, I haven't talked to anyone about it. So you get it. Hey, you and I was just hang and talk about it. I know exactly. <laughs> well, but you know you- what? I want to say something about McCoy. Please. Most people do not really know how McCoy Tyner played. I think you're unless right. they had the records. But I was going to Berkeley and. 70, 71, 72, my, my crew, so to speak, was Lovano, nice. Billy Drews, Frizzell was a little after me, nice. um, Joey Barron, uh, Schofield. Uh, yeah, right. We would hang out all the time. Those are either from school. I hope we get back to school soon because I don't really remember any of my classes. I just remember hanging on the roof of where Billy Drews lived. Uh-huh. And then I remember hanging at the house where Joey Barron lived with this bass player, Mike Zavarella. And then I remember playing in this, you know, <laughs> it was this, it was, we were getting a language together. Yeah. The way it's been done since the beginning of time, you know. But um, McCoy Tyner, they had the, um, the uh, jazz workshop yeah. in Boston, one of the greatest clubs. It was like, so we were just down the street at Berkeley. So when McCoy or Bill Evans or Chick Corea or Herbie Hancock, I mean, I was there every night. Now, McCoy Tyner on any given night was, see, he was sick. I'd say somewhere from the 80s on, he was never quite the same anymore. And there was much more power in his left hand and somehow lost the ability in his right hand to articulate. Right. Wow. But if you caught him before that, particularly in the 70s, after he divorced from from train yeah he was the only piano player that could articulate the right hand the way bobby or a vibes player could articulate on the vibes now i mean that's really something because think about how high they can hit from absolutely and from this relatively lower elevation his notes were that clear and clean and he was the most burning instrumentalist you had to put in there Alphonse Muzant or Billy Cobb or whoever, who whatever drummer he put in, he'd burn him up. Exactly. You can tell that. I mean, I can tell that just as a record. Now, he did that night after night. Wow. So I had to ask myself, how come any set of any night I go there, yeah. it's always on this level? Right. In other words, why doesn't he have a bad night? Now, of course, if I asked him, he would say he had a bad night. Yeah. Course. But whatever the bottom line was, yeah. I couldn't hear the difference. And same thing with McLaughlin. You know, I talked to him a few times and he just started, the, they just started a tour with Shakti. And I was like, you know, like, yeah, completely <laughs> the best amazed, I, amazed. I need a better word, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, yeah. and I'm talking to Matt and him and he goes, oh, no, we just started. You know, it's just not, you know, gelling. I'm going like, like oh, okay, yeah. you know, so I'm saying. <laughs> How did he do that all the time? Right. And that's when I started to figure out some stuff for Effortless Mastery. I said, oh, it must be easy. Right. Nobody does everything 
all the time that's not muscle memory yeah if it's not muscle memory they do it two times out of five they don't do it very well yeah but every time every time so interesting you know so, so the acquisition of technique is really to raise the floor yeah way that's, you know? that's so true I, when you say that about mccoy you know our i say our but just the guitar equivalent is you know um jim hall who who uh, i for for years i've been telling friends of mine uh you know, he, we think of him as such a genteel player, but he played very hard. He played very loud. Like the, the actual physicality was the way a loud guitar player plays. And yet on records and even in live, you hear through the guitar and the amp and it sounds compressed and beautiful and warm and gentle. And everyone, I would tell it to say, yeah, yeah, that that's not true. I said, it's freaky. And then the other day, a buddy of mine sent me a video that just got posted of Jim in the 80s. And it's from a European TV show. And he's playing solo and per the you know aesthetic of the sound they have his guitar acoustically mic'd so much louder than the amp and you hear him going whack 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 whack, whack da, 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 da. and and it's this i was like that's it and, and, and what's so cool to me is that it it's kind of like maybe similar to mccoy is that if you just think about it i mean this is here's my like detective julian projection is like i think there's a certain thing a certain critical threshold of power and clarity that a lot of cats from that generation existed at all the time because by the time it came off the other end of a record you know or out of a radio or whatever it was it had been mutated it, it's not like it's not crooning you know what i mean it's not like they're gently right up to the mic and not they're 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 blasting that there's they're lobbing this shit out of the instrument and i do think I know I've noticed that with a handful of players, not to say you can't be gentle, but I get that sense from McCoy that when we're talking about the baseline technique being higher, I think there is just a delivery property um, that who knows where it comes from. It's different for different people. I remember with Gary Burton, <laughs> you know, Gary grew up in vaudeville as a kid. He would go out and tap dance as a little boy and then he'd play the vibes. And there was always this sense of like, Kind of like you're talking about entertainment more than art. There was always that thing of like, he's going to give you a show no matter what. And he's not going to be goofy doing it, but he's going to, he, he's got to reach that. He's going to play hard enough and clear enough so that you get your money's worth. <clears throat> and and, and I, I do have to say that I've always been charmed by that uh, generation. Well, Gary, that really surprised me when I read that in his book. I mean, because I don't get that <clears throat> overtly from this Gary. Is, no. But I, I don't know if I would call it entertaining. He and Chick were both kind of like, you know, uh, well, it's savant. mesmerizing. Yeah, it's mesmerizing. You know, it's 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 enchanting. It's compelling. It's however you define it. But there seems to be a sense of, you know, this signal will be degraded at every step from the first row to the second row to the last row through the mic, through the amplifier, through the PA. So I'm going to give you everything, and by the time you hear it, it'll be, you know, great. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's well, just there's a, one thing you got to throw in the mix when you talk about those generations. Yeah. And that's the amount of work they were doing. You know. so more than we can fathom. I mean, forget what we're trying to do, we're trying to bolster ourselves from within. Yeah. Because if you were touring as much as they were touring, it would just beat the ego out of you. I mean, not ego like they could still chase each other with knives. I don't mean that no, kind no, of ego. No, of course. No, but the condition. Yeah, you, you didn't have energy to have. You it. wouldn't be caring about you, you would put your hands on the instrument and they would start playing because that preciousness of trying to control a performance would just get beaten out of you. I mean, yeah. you know, you could play. On, <clears throat> there are people that played on 52nd Street uh, longer than most people tour in a, in a year. <laughs> Oh, you know, six weeks over here, then they crossed the street and they did three more weeks. Oh, yeah. Not to mention it's start, it's 9 p.m. to 4 a.m., six nights a week. Or, you know, I mean, Billy Hart is telling me they did three months in California. Jesus, man. That's man. why these cats had families on both coasts. Well, <laughs> it definitely complicates things. I remember trying to swallow about that, whatever that was. He, he, he went out to, um, we were talking about the electric bass, you know, and, I, cause, and, and uh, obviously he's, a master and a pioneer of it in the jazz world and beyond. But I said, Steve, how did you, you know, what was the switch? Cause he's also one of the greatest acoustic bass players. He said, man, I got this month long 
like pop gig in Las Vegas and my family couldn't come out and I needed something to do in the bedroom. And so I played electric all day, you know, and, and these things you think of, man, a month anywhere doing anything in normal times is, is most likely going to push you to do something. <laughs> and hopefully it's familiar. That sounds familiar these days. I mean, this is what's so interesting about it. You know what I've been doing, Kenny? I've been trying, you know, I miss playing so bad and I didn't for, for a lot of it. I was kind of like, I mean, even being with Margaret, it's like, we, I don't, I couldn't, I, we had never been together in the same room, for, you know, in the same city for more than a oh. month and years, you know how it is. And so here we are finally together and we're like, this don't is, tell me, <laughs> man, I, I, we, I, and Lorraine, oh, wait, wait. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> We, we we loved it and it was it very enchanting where we were staying and the whole thing and we were just like man we're this is a blessing and I kind of just forgot about touring, but I I've started. I wouldn't exactly use the word enchanting with us. <laughs> it's different for everyone. But, but don't get me started. I won't. <laughs> Go I'm ahead. Not, what were you saying? Well, I was going to say I started to kind of keep myself engaged. I just started doing um, like solo guitar recitals for by myself in the in the home like you know what i mean like so the stakes are a little higher than practicing it but like i write a set what are you doing in like streaming no fuck for no one to hear i just i sit down and oh. i just i make a set and i play but i have to play the show and i i can't stop you know what um, show I, oh no in other words, you put the mindset I'm no, doing yeah, the my, yeah, here's my thing and once a week i try to do and i record and i listen to it back and and um but it's that thing of like, okay, I can pontificate about my shit in the practice room all I want, but until I just play for an hour straight, it's like it's, you go into it a few minutes and you go, oh, right, it's about dealing. <laughs> like, oh, I actually have to do it now, and it's been and it's so wonderful to do it not for anybody, um, but kind of as a ritual. You know, it, I, Kenny uh, Wallace started doing that a few years back at the Stone. He was doing these. It was like. Uh, concerts that no one were was invited to at the stone it was one of these kind of wonderfully charming things where he would like get this band together he would eat and, and the word would kind of get out they would rehearse all day they would do a full show but the door was, would be locked you know no one could come in sometimes when people would go out and listen through the door and he and it was deep because it was kind of a, an experiment just to see how much you get out how much of the experience of playing really just has to do with the ritual of you setting up your instrument and keeping your commitment and how much of it has to do with the audience. And it's, I don't know, that's kind of where my, that's a terrible. I hate to downgrade the conversation, but did he pay the cats? I think he paid the cats. Okay. <laughs> you you're willing to invest cats. in this lofty idea. Well, man, that's the Zorn sphere. Everyone's taken care of, you know? Right. But, um, yeah, true. I remember I did a show. I won't say where, because it ended ter It was me and the promoter. It's one of the few times that it was just like, you know, what's, uh, what did, as uh, Kenny Walsh would say, my dog didn't get along with his dog. Like we just didn't, it, we, it was, and we did, we were friends until all of a sudden this, basically we were about to go on stage and the electricity, a, a storm occurred. Like I'm telling you like 7.55, we were on at eight and all the electricity went down and they came back and said, well, wait, five minutes, 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Now it's been an hour and no electricity. It's not coming back. <laughs> And they were begging me. They said, can you, we'll go find an acoustic guitar and you'll play acoustic. I said, I'm not going to play a trio show. No, this is not the show I want to present. Like I'm kind of a fatalist. Like I think I can take a hint. The show's not going to happen. <laughs> and anyway, it made them very mad and they didn't like me for it. That Be that as it is. I, it was one of the funniest things because the whole audience waited there. It was, it was like an arts crowd. They like, they live for this shit. You know, they're very cool. Yeah. 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 You know, they're down. They weren't, they, where's my money? Yeah. Cool. And so after an hour of waiting, he, the promoter comes out and says, I'm really sorry, but you know, it's not going to happen. And me and the band went to the front of the stage and it's almost like a procession at a wedding, but we just stood there and shook everyone's hand as they walked out back to their car, you know, and people were saying craziest shit. They're saying, this is one of the best evenings I've <laughs> ever had. I met these people. I sat still for an hour and I thought, well, yeah, man, we didn't have to play at all, you know. So, oh, it, it, like, you know, what's the sh what's the show? When does it become a show? And uh, the pandemic's got me thinking about that quite a bit. And uh, you know, you know what I've been doing during the pandemic? Um, I kind of, in my mind, it's not music anymore. You know, 
Yeah. Because whatever that was had to do with the rest of society or something. Yeah. It kind of was going that way before the pandemic. Yeah. You know, I started to think about music more like breathing. Like, you know, first of all, I don't necessarily have to watch someone else breathe. <laughs> and and uh, I don't really talk about my breathing. And yeah. when, when I'm done breathing, I don't really think back to, boy, I was really breathing good there. Killed it. <clears throat> it just it's just gone down into it but now with this yeah i'm just into through composing it's not, i mean it's not playing free yeah i just because I, I i don't know it's just taken away the last bit i have done some i'm sure you have too some live streams couple sure. live gigs sure. i can't bring myself to play a tune right. because now without that public element i just drop my fingers they go and as long as i don't get ahead of them yeah. They compose something. I could have written it down every time. Get out. There's not a note out of place. Yeah. And I found some cats that are, they're not exactly local, but they're not far. And uh, for some reason, you know, if I play a tune with them, it's okay. It's yeah. good. But they just kind of, I don't know if they're following me or what they're doing, but it sounds like we wrote down a trio set. Wow. And we've done it a few times. So let's just do that. Now, my problem is presenting something with tunes. It's just my head has moved way Past out that. there. And I don't know if I can bring it back. Though I've done a few. Yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah. Chris and I did a duo. I said, Chris, yeah, let's just do this. Yeah, right. I think we allowed. I have this one tune I wrote, yeah. which I call the state of the world. And I wrote it when Donald Trump was about to deliver the State of the Union. So I called it state of the world. The melody is one note. Yeah. Wow. So let's just play this one tune. Yeah. I yeah, play yeah. these chords and you just keep holding this one note. Right. And then you can blow on it if you want. You know, other than that, I can't go back to it. I couldn't go back to it. So it has yeah. really advanced. And the couple of times I've done it, either solo or with these guys, yeah. the people are like, like, where was that from? You know, where did that come from? Of course, at? though. But Kenny, well, I said, look, this is what happened when I had a lot of time on my hands. You know, I like, yeah. this is just what happened. And, and now I, I have to, I, I'm not going to decide because it's not really over yet. So, yeah, do right. I reel it in and present an evening of tunes, or do I just ask you or whoever, yeah, right. let's go in there? And the only we, we abdicate responsibility as soon as you get up there and you get your guitar, and I get up there and sing at the piano. Right. And I don't know because you know what? Whatever's communicating right now, it's dictating really clearly. Right. Kenny, this is like making my heart beat. It's the shit. Because what I hear and you saying that is just the – it's kind of a terrible word for it. But in a way, it's almost like um, it's legitimizing it, the art form as an art form. And there's a lot of pull towards, you know, for lack of a better phrase, the bebop tradition, which says, yeah, but is it a song? Yeah, but is it changes? And – you know, you and I both have enough heroes who kind of denounce compositions. <laughs> you know, at well, some point they're like, like, "This is yeah, that's not Dutch how, composition." Yeah, but that's it. But this is what I mean. It's if anything, yeah. it's elevate. It's elevating. That's why I say it's it's um, it's legitimized. It's 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 just elevating it to what it is, which is this otherworldly magical thing. Margaret, it's funny because wow. she uh, she. You know, I think she's my best critic as a musician. She she'll very comfortably listen to me and go, not that it's bad, but she'll just be like, "That's not what you do," you know, which is something. No, very I'm sorry, bad. but I don't actually know what Margaret does. What does she play? Well, Margaret's a masterful genius singer songwriter and guitarist. You know, and in that in the world of singer songwriters, she's oh boy, I gotta hear her. No, she's the baddest. She really is. And and, and she send she, me some stuff. I will. I will. She's she's incredible. And wow. we, were, we met at Berkeley. We went. We were going at the same time. Oh wait a minute! I met her. You met Berkeley. We, yeah, you we did, did a it. session yes. in the basement, and, and she was there. She took part in it just to you know to, to hang out. I think. Uh, we, I, didn't we actually try to do? We did it one of her tunes or something. I don't think she came up. I don't think we had time. We talked about it though. You were like, "This could happen," and then we were. Oh, we, we were, even actually did something, or she did something. Uh uh. Oh, I, I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. Singing. I, I do remember her singing. She might. We didn't play as a trio. It was there. Gem. Yeah. yeah. Something right. happened. Well, she's a badass. But you mean she actually sits there and listens to you and goes, "No." Nah, I'll show her. I have to be like, I, I'm. You're I'm exaggerating. 
No, was it well? Kind of. I, I I pride. I'm 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 always looking for hurt hurting. Um, and I have some masochistic strain, but uh, where I'm like really curious what could be better. But one of the things that's so interesting to me is over the years that I've been playing with my trio and doing stuff and right. You know, where I'm I'm coming from the jazz world and thinking, okay, well, songs, it's cool to be into songs because I grew up with such free music in a way. And I and there's a certain type of song I'm really interested in. But it's always been so encouraging to me where she'll remind me, like, no matter what stage you're on, you know, there was a period where we were my trio and band we were playing stages that weren't accustomed to jazz as much, you know, standing room only rock shows and, and that was Yeah, like, I bet that's that's once it, you start catching on, and it happens to guitar players more than anybody. Absolutely. Guitar players have You have to figure out, am I going to illuminate from within, this is and it. then they'll get it that way, or do I make some modifications? Well, I imagine that's not that easy to let to uh, you gotta confront legislate. It. Yeah, you got you to you translate it. And this was just the thing, was that I, I felt some imaginary responsibility to package things a certain way. Like you're talking about compositions. And then every time I would relinquish that and say, uh, no, this is actually not only enough, but it's compositional, meaning improv improvised music. Um, it was just tremendous that I think I just started to learn that kind of through her saying, that's actually the shit that that's, that's almost one of our, um, well, it depends on how you look at it. That's, the that's one of the responsibilities an improvising musician can take is say, I'm an ambassador for freedom and transcendence in sound. And composition isn't the same. That's not our architecture. We can include them. But if you listen to My Favorite Things by Coltrane, you're not going, man, but the tune is just so, yeah, it's, it's cool that people know it and that's part of the cultural complexity of it. But that is free music. Any way you slice it, that is free. Well, let me ask you. So I think I do understand what you're saying now. Did Margaret pick up on the fact that you were trying to modify? Yes. Be worthy of the size of the megaphone. And she might have clued you in. You know what, Julian? You don't. Yeah, stop that shit. Because she she actually has the megaphone that's legit. She's the one who's singing songs to people. And it is you know her see people singing her lyrics back to her and it's so literal so she just as a friend was like the fact that you know don't forget you're an abstract artist and if you're an abstract artist you have to understand what elements are abstract and you have well, to you have to own that you know you said free you know and one of my favorite licks that i say is there's only one kind of free music music that's free from self-judgment so therefore Anything you're playing, yeah, could be free music. It's really true, man. God, yeah. it's true. When you said that, you know what? Who popped into my head was um, seeing Dylan. I saw Dylan at the Beacon like a year ago, and it was. Have you ever seen Bob Dylan live? No, just his bus <laughs> at festivals. I'm sure, exactly. Uh, well, the, the, you know the the the, the pulse <laughs> that I hear is like. It's either the greatest show you've ever seen or the worst show you've ever seen. You know, again, these are, yeah. Well, this more of the latter in recent years. The, yeah, exactly. That's kind of the, that's the, that's, I'd always heard that. And there was one. But I never got him to begin with. But I use as an example. Is that right? When you regard the message coming out of you with that kind of, you know, the absence of self judgment, yes. Yes. you change the world. Yeah. So true. Yeah, that's why I came to. But mind. What were you going to say? I'm sorry. No, I can't. no, 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 no. It's funny because I actually, I similarly, I've always, I, I, I plead ignorance with a lot of music, lyrical music. I always say it's kind of like being colorblind. I'm kind of like lyric blind. I don't hear. I can't. I don't know what people are saying if they sing it, um, literally. So, uh, but we saw him live, and it was, you know, it's all his hits, right? It's all his songs. Complete. It felt like I was watching Ornette, man. The melodies were, there was nothing you've ever heard before. It was present. It was free of self-judgment. It was the most astounding presentation wow. I had seen. And wow. part of what I thought was so interesting was that, you know, I've got this teacher I talk about a lot he, named Ron Browning. Ron Browning. He, he's Wait a minute. Ron Browning, is he in Cleveland? He, I think he, well, he was one, but he's in Nashville. An old friend of Jamie Haddad's and, and, and uh, Joe's. Really? But he's okay. Keep is this the same Ron Brown? He's a, he's like a singer, sing, singing coach. He works with a lot of like 
you know, oh, he, maybe not the same guy. I'm sorry. Okay, might be different, but I wouldn't be surprised. He's he's special, right? He's you know he's like um he's like the guy you go that like a you know he's like a phrasing expert. That's kind of his shit. And you said you people record labels will send people to him. Wow. Down oh, that's, that's not that guy. Okay, okay. It's it, he he's a he's a badass, you know. Um, and I I I used to I study with him when I can on Skype and things because I I he's what do you study? Stuff. Well, I said he's singing. Crazy. No, 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 never for me. <laughs> but, 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 uh, uh well, it's been happening a lot lately, you know. Uh, thing. Kevin uh, has oh. been singing and yeah, Brad, good. Brad, I mean, all these guys, I, you know, it's in them. I, I, uh, um, well, uh, I told, yeah. I sent a message to both of them don't quit your day job. <laughs> That's the funny thing with singing, man. It's like, uh, we don't uh, it. it's, uh, uh uh, I, 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 uh, I really have liked what I've heard when they've done it. And at the same time, I, I don't have any desire. I go the other way. No, I used to be a singer, man. Yeah. See, there we go. So you, you actually sang. Tell what did you sing? Well, I used to sing like Joe Cocker and Beatles and, uh, Ray wow. Charles. Wow. And, uh, great and I wrote songs. Kenny. Oh yeah. I mean, I really more of a, it used, there used to be a place in, in Cambridge called Jack's. It was a cafe. Yeah. It was between Cambridge. And so once a week I would sing there. And the funny thing is the first tour I ever did in, in Europe, I, I was hanging out in Munich with a friend of mine and I sat in at the Domitzeel, which was the main club there at the time. Yeah. And this yeah. agent comes up to me and says, you know, I could book you, you know, like that, you know. <laughs> and, yeah. and I said, well, yeah. And I had just been in Paris and I had made a recording at the French radio. But I played and sang. This would have been 80, 81. Dang. So I gave him the tape. So the cat must have heard me sing. I get over there and it says, I had the poster for years. Ken Verna, the singing piano. <laughs> they get out. And for three weeks, I had to uh, play in these rat scales. Oh my God. On these uprights and sing. Wow. All those students, yeah. I bet you it was killer, man. I want to hear it. I know you killed it. All right, here we go. You have it? Yes. No, I don't have it exactly, but uh, yeah, so this seems like all wound up. All right, here we go. I, um, I usually like to have a mic a little closer. Let's see. All right, there we go. This is just for you, man. Oh, man, I'm so great. Luckily, there's nobody else listening. Yeah, no one's here. Can you hear me? We can okay, hear you. No, it cut out for a okay. sec. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Look, you can hear me now? Yeah, we got out of sync for a second. I think we can hear you now. Okay. I'm just doing this for you, Julian. Luckily, there's nobody else listening, okay? <laughs> I'm so glad. You're the only one I see. <laughs> <laughs> see, I got you already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My funny valentine Sweet comic valentine You make me smile With your heart Your looks are laughable Unphotographable Yet you're my favorite work of art Is your figure Less than Greek Is your mouth A little weak <clears throat> When you Open it To speak Are you Small So don't 
change your hair for me. Not if you care for me. Stay, little Valentine. Stay. Each day is Valentine's Day. did that man <laughs> you make me cry you that was you sound incredible that's Thank so you. fucked up that you just did that <laughs> you just did that i don't know why i did that i've been teaching all day and somewhere in the fourth hour i actually lose my mind <laughs> but you it's so, god my god you sound gorgeous and it's so profound to hear your the manifestation of you through voice and harmony and melody and pacing. It's like, fuck, I don't want to follow that ever. No, brother, could, could, <laughs> could you play something for us? Anything. Yeah, but. Now you know officially it really could be anything. <laughs> no, I don't have. And then I we could play, you know, we could just create something. I, that I'm for, but thanks for that, kid. That was gorgeous. That was so. That was so profoundly special. Uh, uh, did you sing as a kid? Like, why do you? Why can you do that? I did everything as a kid. I used to do impressions of really? TV characters. I used to fake sing opera. Wow. I used to imitate Jackie Gleason. Wow. 
<laughs> do you feel like you're a good mimic like 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 i mean that like no, technically, no. so you, yeah I, either am i i can't no I can't. but you just wow do you do you are you do you have siblings are you the youngest two older brothers you, way older what about yeah. you you're an only child right no well I'm, I'm the youngest of five but oh i didn't know that yeah but but two it's it's, it's kind of like like a Two kids from my my father's previous marriage, two from my mother's previous marriage. Then they got married and had me. So it's kind of like an only child of my parents. But that's what it felt like when I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But but also the youngest. Um, so man, that was so great. That's so great. That's just that's yeah. I don't know why I did that. i well. I'm very glad you did. I I, I made me tear up that was gorgeous well we have i know you have to play for everybody let me just let me just listen man i, I don't i didn't i don't even have anything prepared either so i, I can... you are you are so blessed on so many levels and uh it's not a generational thing because i think you are right there with all the saints we're talking about you know you got all all the you have all those components and everything, you know, the musically, and it is in total service of this world. And I do think we're going to see an era that was very much like the 60s. Yeah. Because nobody was include, has ever been uh, gone through this kind of stuff. And we're going to see a lot of music that rises way above just the issue of music. I think you're I, I ask a lot of people. Uh, I was doing an interview series for a while where we would, we, I don't think we put it out, but yeah. I would ask these different musicians, do you think music is the message or do you think music is the messenger? Oh, this is it. Oh, wow. And I think both ideas are valid, but I think Absolutely. right now, what you were saying before, yeah. it's a great opportunity. And that's why Train was so up there because music, as developed as it was, yes. was a message of something that goes even beyond music. Music points to something yeah and you know and it's it, it and that takes it even it, it it takes music higher because it describes something that's beyond music even exactly but beyond the cognitive shit that we're, we're kind right of and, and you and you got it man you're very kind and i just keep adding days to your months and months to your years yeah <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying one day at a time <laughs> oh i forgot days to, yeah hours to your days i man I, you got me all inspired i don't even you know before i came on here i was just i've been just kind of sitting playing um i don't have anything prepared for you cause I, I i so i, I can uh what do we, what, what i can um well, first of all, can you can you hear this? Can, can, yes. Uh, how about I'll just play? I'll improvise for a second, and then then we'll uh, we'll go from okay. there. Okay. Okay. Um, but or actually, are you down to do it with me? Do you want to do it together? Yeah, sure. But you want to just play a little bit because there's a lot of guitar players here. I'll oh, yeah. bet. Oh, that's I would I, just we're love to hear. We're everywhere. A little, uh, you know, reduction, yeah. a little man. drizzle, man. Let's see.
Yeah, man. Man, it's so fun to play with you. Yeah, I just went, I, I, I meant to put headphones in, but I could still hear you. Yeah, you, I, you know this shit sounded so different on the other end, if at all. But I just to think to pl interact with you, man, is so. Cool. I'm gonna call you one of these weeks. So we'll just do it, you know, just do cool. it on a day when we got some time. I would love it. I've been, I, I, I've done one other thing like this for privately, and and uh, it's great, man. I mean, I know it's it's. It, I, it's just so it's so deep it's so deep i think it's taking us another place you know i think it is too just you know you know we only have a little time and i i'll bet we you know we usually use the second hour for questions but it's just it's been so organic i know man just whatever it is you know so i'd All like right. vivian open you want it to... up open it up i just love talking yeah. to absolutely same here yeah it's so always whoever has a question can put it in the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, so in the bottom of your screen, you have um, says reactions. So you can yeah. <laughs> raise your hand. <laughs> yeah, who eats, who I think said... there was a question from, where is it? Clifford. Oh, he went. Clifford, well, out of here. He got a gig. Um, like, he was wondering, Julian, did you ever study Indian music at some point? I did. I studied. I did um, study uh, Indian classical music at the Ali Akbar College of Music in San Rafael, California. I studied sitar for about six months and tabla for about six months, which is nothing uh, <laughs> compared. What do they say in Indian music? You need about 120 years to, to master an instrument. So um, a fraction of a fraction. And then I, I, I was lucky. I took a, a guitar lesson with Ali Akbar Khan at his house. Wow. It was unbelievable, and um, he spent about it was an hour lesson, and forty five minutes or fifty minutes was him just tuning the guitar, uh, my guitar. He was like, "Can I see your guitar?" And I said, "Sure," and, and he tuned it, and I, I watched him tune it and get all the overtones, just like I'd never seen this done ever. And it was mass. It was just it was, that was the lesson, and then at the end. I think he showed me a, he, I believe he showed me one scale, like a raga. He said something to think about, you know, and, but just watching him tune a guitar was the lesson. It was unbelievable. And, uh, but that music. What's the difference between the two in the tuning? It, they're totally different. I don't even know what Sorode is, but he, he had played guitar at some point, like he hit performances on, on like a, a jazz box kind of guitar. He was playing Indian classical music, but uh, so he was familiar with the instrument and, you know, intimately. Uh, but he wasn't playing like, you know, 
chords on it. He's playing his music and his language in there. Oh, okay. But yeah, so so that that's definitely a part of my life. Great question. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. I can hear Next it. up, Taylor. Oh, Taylor. What's up? Long time no see, old friend. I know. How are you doing? I'm great. Everything's just, uh, well, you know how it is with the pandemic. It's just every day's a mystery. And you suck. Sucks. <laughs> you yeah. have the best way to put it and um, yeah. is just taking it one step at a time. I mean, I'm still, I'm combating everything. I'm doing online studies with North Texas and just trying to make my way through it. And um, I mean, as much as I can, just enjoying, enjoying the music every day's it's a blessing, but it, like I said previously, it's just, it's, it's always a mystery, man, truly. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, it, it's always a pleasure to hear both you and Kenny. It's just, thanks, Taylor. It, Thank there's you. always something rejuvenating about that. But um, to get to the full circle of what I'm, yeah. what I'm getting at here. Um, so a question for both of you is, um, and this is something I think that's more or less been happening to me. Granted, I'm a student, you both are, you know, you guys are the cats. You guys are like just right up there. But um, how have you both tried to combat being frustrated when you're feeling stuck or having um, or just kind of feeling like you're in that state of being in a rut? I know I've, I've been experiencing it a lot with myself due to the fact that I'm not in Texas and not playing with all the students and whatnot. But, you know, especially when you're confined to being in a musical space all alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know you're always self you're self bickering like you're you're constantly um having arguments with your ego so how is that how is that differentiating and how are you both trying to combat that for yourselves in practice i go you got it kenny i mean Taylor, that's a fabulous question kenny yeah me. it really is and i think it's a dominant question of our era yeah. um for a lot of this time i considered myself to be sort of on a retreat so to me, it wasn't about me and the pandemic or me and the government, you know, Trump or anything like that. It was between me and my mind. Mm -hmm. So it really was a lot of watch. You know, uh, Ramana Maharshi is not a guy I follow, but his, I mean, he's a great guru, but his dominant thing was, who am I? Who are you? So I felt like with the pandemic, there was a lot more time to keep asking that question over and over again. Who yeah. am I? And the whole point is not, you don't answer it. You ask it and then you leave the space open. In other words, I have had a, a guru, a teacher for over 30 years, right? And I don't think I got it. I really don't think I got it. I think I'm one of the most latent students of it that's ever been brought to it. I think I've had a fabulous teacher. I don't speak about it in public. But what I will say is that it alerted me to the fact that Everything is a product of your mind. Yeah. We literally do create the world that we live in. Now, do I really believe that the furniture I'm looking at this room is my creation? Yes, I do believe it, but I'm yeah. nowhere near to being able to see that. Right. So, but I know that in more pr practical distances between me and what I call reality, because I've meditated in a temple, for example, and mm -hmm. half of the time I was worried about, I can remember years ago, man, I have no work in the fall, <laughs> you know, or, you know, nobody's doing this or this guy got that or whatever, you know, what your mind does. And then all of a sudden I'd have these experiences like whoosh, like somebody just sucked all that stuff out of my brain yeah. and I was just there. And the gratitude and the stuff that, that Julian has had all his life because mm -hmm. he had good parents. I mean, I can't tell you, we had uh, a Felicia Rashad here a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Wow. And she is an amazing woman because she's she and I actually share some of this, what which I'm just talking about. So wow. I asked her to come in. She is a total being, uh, just amazing. And again, it's no accident. She had an amazing family yeah. that that launched her. I did not. So I've had to really try to find it myself. Yeah. My mind has been my worst enemy for a lot of my life. And it's caused me to work and find, you know, it's like fumbling around, Taylor, for the light switch. Right. Mm -hmm. And I almost fumble around for that light switch every day. When I wake up, it's the worst, like, oh, God, what am I, you know, <laughs> honestly, I have to fumble around for the light switch every day. And right, one right. Thing or, one thing or another, sometimes it's my students that save me because I need to be a vessel for my students. And then that saved me. All of a sudden, all this hip shit's coming out of me. 
that I wasn't, you know, if they saw me before, you know, 10 minutes earlier, it was like, oh my God, what am I going to, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so transformation, the point is this, by whatever means, comes from the inside. So I have been always, because of self-preservation, not because of any overt spirituality, I have always been looking for that, even in front of the music, because it has this profound effect on the music. Right. So that's right. what I've been doing. I got to admit, recently, because after a certain while, I was saying, okay, this has been really great. Now I'm ready for it to be over. Yeah, you know, yeah, lesson yeah, learned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, funny thing about the pandemic, it didn't just happen for me to learn spiritual lessons. It's like, <laughs> hello, it's still here. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I found myself really sliding lately, just like, yeah, I just I do my lessons oh, yeah. and I watch TV <laughs> and I have some vodka yeah. and I go to sleep and I wake up and I do my lessons and I watch some TV, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. And recently I've been trying to get back on the beam. What keeps yeah. it fresh is this ever evolving thing between my ears. Right. I mean, there's an ancient Sanskrit, I've said it on this thing before. There's one of the oldest Sanskrit sayings in the mind bondage in the mind liberation. Yeah. I would have to yeah. say that even at my worst, I'm always living by that. The answer is always in here, not out there. Doesn't matter who the president is. Yeah. Amen, brother. Amen. That's beautifully so said. Good. That's I, awesome. Do you I, have any input, Julian? I, other than, I just thought that was perfect. That's that's the I, I second that um, or I, I am inspired by hearing Kenny say that. And I, I think, um, you know, uh, Implicit in what Kenny's saying is a high degree of um, empathy for the fact that it's the human condition to be in a rut. You know, it's not like everyone else has got their shit together, but somehow you just found yourself in a rut. I, I truly believe we're we're all dealing with the same stuff. So that's that's can be comforting, and you can always just kind of look left and look right at your fellow musicians, and often you'll be reminded that. Um, but I, I I I think what Kenny said. I, I hope that. Uh, resonates with you because that's the the heart of it it all does man everything just yeah. incredible thank, thank you both you. good to see you yeah hope out we, there. yeah hope we can get in touch soon julian i look forward to it bye yeah take care my friend bye thanks taylor next thank you guys uh, thanks kenny Steven. hey you're welcome <laughs> So, Viv? Ruben. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi, hi we guys. Hear you. Hi, Ruben. How you doing? I'm I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm in London at the moment. Um, yeah. Thank you both for this um, this talk. I'm finding it really useful. Um, it's a question for both of you. I guess more specifically, Kenny, because um, I'm reading your book. Um, maybe similar to what you just answered with Taylor, but um, I just wondered if you could uh, give me a bit more information about kind of practicing with fear. Um, I, I'm a drummer and I'm finding kind of my practice quite fearful. Um, I, I, I find it frustrating, overwhelming and unenjoyable. Um, I want to sound better than I am at the moment. And, I, and well, that's, I that's where the fear comes from. That's, yeah. Yeah. So um, the problem is whether you want to sound better or not, it actually has the reverse effect. Wanting to sound better is at the precise moment when you start sounding worse. So Everless Mastery postures, postulates, yep. pos posits, uh, but yeah. that there's a world of thoughts. And when those thoughts fire off, you try to satisfy those thoughts. And that's when you sink. There's another part where you're just in the space. That's what's described in the book, the space. You can find the space with a lot of things, you know, a lot of techniques. I like something because a very lazy spiritual seeker like myself this, I finally refined it down to something. I like to call it this. It's so easy, even an American can do it. <laughs> and here it is, Ruben. You're breathing already, right? Mm. Just watch yourself breathe for like 30 seconds. Everybody. If you're really watching yourself breathe, you're probably not thinking. And that's what you want to learn to, this is the essence of effortless mastery. If you get comfortable with that, then you pick up a stick and you hit something. And if it pulls you out of that space, 
you put the stick down and you go back to that. Could be breathing, it could be focusing on a space above your head. These are all things I came up with, but they're hardly original. Focus on a space above your head. Now, while I'm focusing on that, I am not focusing on the sound. I'm focusing on, a, on my breathing. The breathing is really good because if the body were a clock, the breathing would surely be the second hand. So every time you go back to your breathing, you're in the moment. The thing that's scaring you is not the moment. You could never be afraid in the moment. It's always the past or the future. It's not what you're doing. It's what you think what you're doing. It's your worry about what it's leading to or what it's not leading to. The weight of that is so heavy that it makes the moment intolerable. So if you practice going into the space, going into the moment, and starting to touch your instrument, you introduce yourself to the baggage-free relationship between you and the instrument. And at first it might be a question of seconds, but it becomes more familiar. And after a while you've made a connection. You know, you have to do a mental bypass. You, the mind at this point for you and so many people is a negative element it creates controversy where there is none. It's not even you that plays, it's the body. And once you come to terms with that, leave the mind out of the way and you become the instrument that plays the instrument. Then the mind is free, having shorned the baggage of the past and the future. The mind is free to pursue what it's good at which is the superconscious issues. Are you an individual mind or are you one with a universal mind? It's the difference between being an individual drop on a kitchen counter, which dries up rather quickly, or being a drop in the ocean and living forever. So while you live forever, the body plays the instrument. And if you follow loosely along those lines, You'll find what everybody's looking for through everything. People that play music, it may be more obvious, but at the person that cleans toilets is looking for the same thing. That's what I learned from the guru. Liberation. Souls voluntarily enshrine themselves in a body and a contracted mind in order to learn liberation while inhabiting this very body and this very mind. And a musician, when he learns to be liberated and not have the music detract from that, it doesn't matter what you play. And what you're feeling right now, that's the first bump in the road that's removed because you're heading for something far greater than that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> did you did we did you feel me, Ruben? Yeah, totally. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, so man. Much. It's great. There's a lot out there, but if you want, watch yourself breathe and give the responsibility for hitting the drums to your arms and feet. Okay? Don't think about it immediately as practicing. Think about it as making the connection that you have missed or you had it a long time ago, and then you made the deadly bargain with the devil. You decided to become educated. <sighs> okay? Now you want to reconnect and then let the body take the education from there so that you can remain... If you're in the space, you're, you're beyond fear because fear is only the future and the past. And if you believe in that, then support yourself as much as possible. Teachers, classes, whatever. You know, a lot of people do things like even Alexander Technique. They don't realize they all have seemingly different goals, but all their goals are liberation. Always. Always. They just kind of have, they kind of come through different vessels. Sometimes it's liberating the body so that the mind has less to transcend. Sometimes it's liberating the mind so that it's not dragging the body around. Sometimes it's 
Reiki, it's Qigong, yeah. it's Tai Chi. But liberation is always behind it all. But it's amazing to me what Effortless Mastery does that's, that was uh, innovative is that I know people that spend all week going after liberation, then they come back to their instrument and suddenly they're narcissists again. How do I sound? How do I sound? How do I sound now? How do I sound now? So all Effortless Mastery said, if you have a great yoga class, when you come back to the instrument, don't think of music. Remember the yoga class. If you have something that's been offering liberation, think of it while your body makes sound on the instrument and you'll cross the divide. And once you do that, you will be able to do more things. You'll be able to practice something. You'll be able to play something. But first, the con you're not going to retrieve the connection with the very thing that is your trigger for low self-esteem, which is playing and practicing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You need to make the connection and then introduce, reintroduce practicing and playing, cherishing the thing that's most cherishable, the connection. I'd rather play like shit and have the connection then be a virtuoso and hate what I play. All right, enough said. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ruben. <laughs> Next up is uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, first of all, thank you so much for having this. This has been amazing. Uh, we're currently in Boston right now, so uh, this is really cool. Uh, yeah, so this is a question for you, Julian, and kind of based off what Kenny was talking about. So in Kenny's book, and as well as like just in his teachings, mm -hmm. he talks about becoming the instrument, just as he was speaking, about, mm -hmm. as being like the goal, yeah. or realizing that you're the instrument. So I don't know if you necessarily use those terms, but for whatever that means for you, how has your journey been in like becoming the instrument? Wow, that's such a great question. Um, You know, it's it's kind of funny because the the what do you what do you play? Do you play guitar? Or what do you play? I do play guitar. Okay, cool, cool. So you know, you know, the guitar is a very um, it's it's a it, it's it's uh, it's a machine that does certain things and has certain parameters. Like it's it, it can you can play too hard, you can play too light, you can um, you can really interface with a guitar. You know, it's not just buttons. Um, I don't mean like, a, I wasn't alluding to the piano being buttons. I mean, like, it's not like a robot where you just press buttons. And so I've always felt like, as far as uh, maybe my interpretation of that message about being the instrument, it's been posed internally as a question of how can I facilitate this machine to work as healthy as possible? And not even efficiently, you know, it's not about... Uh, there's a lot of guitar teachers that have to do with efficiency and playing very lightly to get a big sound. It's, it's not that it's more like, how do I, how do I help this box do the thing that it, it does so well, you know, in the hands of so many people. And, um, I think I started thinking more that way when I played old, uh, a lot of, uh, like vintage acoustic guitars, to be honest, because I play these Holy grail guitars and man, it would be like, well, if it doesn't sound good, it's not the guitar's fault. You know, if it's not <laughs> resonating, it's not because this, you know, 19, whatever, 31 Martin OM 28 isn't the right instrument. So it was always about liberate the instrument and in turn you're in service and in turn you, you kind of shed some of the weight of being like the guitar player, you know. And I've always been very conscious not to feel like uh, having a sense of being like a savior, like an instrumental savior with the instrument which can be a thing that as a guitar practicing student, you know, you can slip into of like, well, I'm the expert. I know all this shit. Give me the guitar and I'll show you. And I've always felt like if, if you're thinking that way, you might be um, kind of suppressing some of the like literal resonant qualities of the guitar. Like, for example, that can lead to your whole abdomen just being tight because you're all like revved up. When that happens, often there's kind of a low, like the guitar doesn't resonate as much when you're gripping. 
you know so you then you kind of chill out and the guitar sounds better or you can't hear as well because you're so thinking so much about the shit you want to do but you can't even hear how the guitar actually sounds to me that's the calibrator always instrument to that end and i understand this is a very privileged position but i do think it's available to everyone it's just sometimes not always obvious um i've always thought of vintage instruments as the best guitar teachers you know because they kind of show you go to a you know boston wonder what your great guitar store is for vintage stuff what kind of guitar do you play right now i have a joe paz squire so i don't know what it's what it's called but it's, you want to no, just grab it no 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 you don't have to i just wanted to know what, what kind of type of instrument uh, one thing that could be cool for you is to come to yeah someone said music emporium music emporium is fabulous uh do you ever get to new york yeah, I actually live there. Oh, you live there. Go to, you know, T.R. Crandall in the East Village or go to Retro Fret in Brooklyn and just sit there for an hour. They're very friendly and play very um, fancy old guitars and ask yourself the same question because it'll be a different answer for how to utilize yourself as an instrument depending on if it's an old Fender, if it's an old Gibson, if it's an old Martin. And it's a, it's a little, I know that's it seems kind of fetishy for me to talk about the equipment, but it's a real thing with guitar. You kind of have to have played great examples to know the parameters. And then in turn, you learn how to be invisible and honor it. Um, so I used to do like, I, I was very lucky because I borrowed a lot of guitars from a lot of people who had them. But I would take something for a month and just, that was my teacher. Next month, a totally different type of guitar. And I'd go through these, like, like an encyclopedic experience of all these things, just by going down to the guitar store, you know. Um, it's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> very tangible thing you know that's my dream is to save up a lot of money and buy a bunch of holy grail guitars and start like a training course where people have to just play them that's like what you're forced to do is just play like a 59 les paul until it sounds good you know? wow it'll teach your system a lot about calibration you know um does that is that does that resonate with you at all like total if your vibrations here mine no. is like slowly getting there yeah <laughs> you're there man <laughs> whatever you're doing, you're doing the right thing i can already tell so good luck i appreciate it yeah so i see next up uh zachary hello thank, hello. thank you both for doing this a lot it's been really great pleasure my question is i think it'll be a kind of quick one I didn't think about it too much, but um, it's my favorite questions. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny, when you're talking about just playing the music and letting it flow, you know what, Zach? You should ask something of because you're in my class. So yep, it, it's going to Julian too. Okay, oh, I'm here either way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm here. When when I'm playing, when I'm trying to just play music, like how you're teaching. Sometimes I still kind of get caught up, like I'll, I'll come across something that I can't really do technically. And then while I'm playing the music, I'll just start playing the technic, like I'll start working on the technical stuff for like five minutes. And then I'm just, the whole practice thing is kind of, kind of wrecked. Okay. And well, do you have any tips for- I'm gonna give a short thing and then turn it over to Julian, but it's what I was saying before, it's really separating in your, in your own mind. Am I practicing or am I playing? Because if I'm playing and I start going for something that's not developed yet, it takes me out of the aesthetic of playing. Instead of a playing, I like to keep simple. What spills out of me resonates from me, and I keep it resonating by really enjoying it coming out, mm -hmm. honoring it, or even loving it. I mean, now it's, a, it's an involuntary muscle, Zach. If I go my gut reaction you know you know the knee jerk reaction thing is like ah you know if someone's cooking sauce on the on the stove i'm not going to go mm, i should really like that smell you know i go like oh, yeah. you know i mean it's yeah. now uh being drawn by the sound of my instrument any instrument and it doesn't have to be a pretty sound although there is no exactly. other you know funny thing is again in spirituality the the higher force thing is understanding it's non non duality yeah. so honoring your dark side um you know i'm not there in life but in music 
I can't find a sound that doesn't resonate. So it's a now, it, it, it's, you, you program yourself. It's now an a, a instant reaction, right? So playing automatically sends me into sort of a stream of enjoyment that I wouldn't want to, on the other hand, the things I'd like to work out, I'd like to have a safe space yeah. where I don't have to keep real time going and I can break it down and really work it out and then see if it has an influence on my playing. So to me, and hopefully as we spend more time together, it's a separation of those two things that keeps the playing flowing, but makes the practicing more effective. Now I'll hand it over yeah. to Julian. That's perfect and you know, it's hard to beat that, right? Um, and I agree with it, especially in the, 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 uh, the what, what, um, I like the question. I, and I think I understand it well, but having a safe space for both is critical, you know, like really for both, like it's, it's not one or the other. I, you know what I tend to do a lot is I'm, I'm, I might be similar to you, um, in that respect of like I set out to play and then all of a sudden, boom, I deviate. And then all of a sudden I'm stressing out about something is I, I keep a lot of lists. I'm kind of a pen and paper um, person. So, so if I start practicing and something comes up, that's like, you know, that feeling where you're playing, you're like, Ooh, shit, I should deal with this at some point. I, I, I'm a fan of like writing that down and being like this, this thing. It can, and it's, you have to kind of say it in your own language. You know, it can be a technical thing and say, Oh, I want this vibe that I heard somewhere else. And then I just kind of keep, going either with it or with something else. Um, I find I get frustrated when I keep having the same frustrations every time I go to, to it's almost like I forget that I wasn't good at it yesterday. And then I have the stark reality that the next day I come to it and I'm still lo and behold, not any diff better at it. So I, I keep a lot of documentation. I throw it out when I'm done. You know, it's not like I have archives, but I have a lot of pads of paper that basically are being like, you know, Check out this, blah, 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 try that. And, and then the other thing I was going to say about it is I don't, you know, time is of the essence, right? When I was younger, I practiced a lot more than I do now. But I do remember when I would have like, you know, eight hours to play slash practice. I, I did notice there were some, uh, there was a certain rhythm to this exact trajectory that you're describing. I would start by playing, I would get distracted. And the cycle, and I'd kind of work on some shit. I'd get frustrated. I'd get hungry. I'd want to play. I'd find something I want to practice. And each cycle was about like, you know, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour long. And when I'd have these long stretches over the course of eight hours, you can actually touch on things like eight different times. You know what I mean? So there's like the first blush where I'd work on it, forget about it. Work on it again, forget about it. And I found that that was actually very effective for me. I remember Mick Goodrick used to say something similar. That you just, if you go long enough, you'll come back to the beginning. But the trouble is sometimes we try to tackle eight hours worth of work in 30 minutes. And then we wonder, we think we suck. You know, no, some things take a while. And I, I think it's very important to make sure. And, and also similarly, sometimes you have 10 minutes of energy to practice and you're trying to stretch it out over eight hours. And that can cause a lot of suffering, you know? Hey, let, kind me of customize, let me customize Zach's question yeah. a little bit for you. Do you find yourself playing? I mean, you play gigs and you're totally in the flow of music. Do you get distracted by something you'd like to do, but you're not quite ready to do it? And then I think is a little bit what he's talking about. And then lose the thread of music alone. Do you get distracted by your own desire to play something? That really maybe belongs in the shed more than on the stage. Oh, so really, yeah, I see what you mean. Uh, I, I get distracted, but I, I, I don't, I don't mind it. Nothing I had, nothing was, nothing's that precious. I think that's more, that's more the red flag. That if I, if I, if if I, and I'm projecting, I'm not there now, but I can imagine that if I'm playing, and then I get distracted, and I really am like, that was bad because that other thing was so important that I can't drop it I, I i sometimes think of that as like a little alarm clock to be like nothing's that important you can give it up you know i don't i didn't need i don't need to finish anything really i don't have to um it's not a disgrace so so yeah I've, i i definitely get distracted i run into things technically that it's funny that i can't say i relate to a feeling as much of like oh i went to play this thing 
and I couldn't. And I don't say that because I can play everything. I just don't think I imagine many things outside of what I already am familiar with. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? If I'm being honest, it's not like, oh. Zach is I... probably thinking there's a lot of things that he still wants to play. There, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. There, I, and, and, and you should follow them. I, I think, again, it's um, if I suppose, like when Kenny and I were playing before, there was some shit where I thought I was going to get something and I didn't. Like I kind of, in guitar player language, I fucked it up. Like I, I missed the string. And I just thought it was the life. I thought that shit was so funny because I was just like, it wasn't that bad. You know, you didn't know. No one knew. And I thought it was kind of entertaining. So yeah, there's a twisted sense of humor to the whole thing that I, I do think is imperative if you want to do this. <laughs> it's, it's fucking absurd, man. The fact that we can be here even considering going for things, not being good. This is such a luxury that I would say most importantly, kind of like Kenny's saying, is just make sure you understand your rhythm with it. If you deviate and you find a technical thing that you want to do and you can't do it and you feel like garbage, well, go look at it. But don't feel like it has to match my experience of the guitar at all. You know, you're going to come up with like a, you're going to have a great sense of humor about it. Right. Yeah. I, just... I can also distill it a little bit down to this, Zach. Don't let the things you don't know overwhelm you. It's true. You still have, you know, you're in a different stage and there's a lot of things you want to learn. Don't let it overwhelm you because then it comes in in multiples and you can't really oh, true so true that's what i was trying to do when we got together right let's mm -hmm. absorb what specifically can i absorb that i haven't absorbed you know and with incremental is really important when it gets to be sort of a uh, swaths uh you don't really zoom in on anything and then you have this odd feeling that's is not getting better you know yeah, you're getting better. You all, you. I don't. I've never met a guitar player who didn't get better every day just by existing on the planet and thinking about the guitar. There's no one, no one. And people love. Sometimes get they get they have this romantic notion that they've stayed the same for 20 years and they're they never got better. It's it's not true because your life experience keeps going. So, my money's on you, Zach. I hope that resonates with you a little bit. There you go. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Well, we're kind of there, huh? Did we do it? Well, it's eight eight oh one. That's pro some pro shit. I know it's such a nice hang. Oh, it's so good, and Vivian too. It's a, it, you're so crucial to this feeling, so comfortable and wonderful. I know we didn't get to see you, but thank you. It's it's um, two o'clock in the morning for her. I know you oh, gotta yeah, go to it's bed. Pretty late, but you know, got used to it by now. I, I bet. I bet. In her town, there's not a single other person awake. I believe it. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, what do you think, Viv? Yeah. Julian, thank you. Let me tell you. Now, let me just say this, and then I'll let Viv wrap it up. I invite you because you embody the thing. May I talk about it more? But you embody yeah. most of what I talk about. Yeah. Well, I hope you know that. I, I to find the words. Your playing and your personage okay. exemplify it, and I think. Your family it launched you in the right way. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of shit you didn't have to correct. <laughs> be, ha be happy, brother. Yeah, I count my blessings just to yeah. attempt yeah. anything. So uh, thank you. Just know that you, you've been a hero and a friend of mine since I was a little boy. And I it's it's one of the highlights of my life. So You've been a friend and a hero of mine since I was a middle-aged man. <laughs> <laughs> my work here is done. <laughs> thank you, Julian. Thank, thank you. you thank you, everybody yeah. here. Thank you, Vivian. Good night. Thank you all. Thank well, you so I'm, much. We'll be back next week. So um, you'll get an email. Yeah. Take thank care, you. everybody. Take care, Bye. everybody. Bye.